bacteria, by uh, viruses and, and fungi. And not only that as the processes, but they also actually influence heavily change the modification and the DNA up to now. Uh, but now in the Anthropocene, uh, like Mark was saying, um, the Homo sapiens becomes the ruler of evolution and he much faster than normally influences the, the evolution. And of course we have very interesting concepts like the call it biohacking, the, um, the, the um, augmented uh, pharmacology, the, the cyborg Mark was mentioning. Um, I'm also thinking about the gene editing of course and uh, last but not least the transhumanism. And um, so transhumanism subject of today is a term coming from 1957 from the brother of Aldous Huxley, so it's Julian Huxley. And he was saying at that time actually there should be a way to overcome misery and constraints of human life, right? Um, and today would of course say true technology. So today it's our age where we have all theoretically all means and we can use technology. So then what the, the, the um, thing on trans, uh, let me just put this in first remote. Just, uh, no. Uh, yes. Uh, so, I guess, <coughs> yeah, the promises are extended lifespan beyond a biological state. So, we live longer than, I don't know, 100, 150 years. We might even be able to upload our brain on the cloud. They have clones. It's a lot about the increased human capabilities. So, it means um, we would have um, possibilities to run faster, sense more, have a higher capacity of, um, of uh, perception, reasoning. Um, we would be able maybe to, to spend more time, fly to space with starships and so on. And ultimately the idea is that this would increase the life quality because we would go into a personal development, we would have uh, possibilities, we would even self-transform and transcend ourselves. So that's and I think a natural promises on tra by transhumanism. And a very popular document, this is the Transhumanist Manifesto by Natasha Vita Moore. And the version 4 came out actually last year. But of course, there's critical um, writing as well, like Godlike Beings by Walker or Transhumanism and Inequality. So, <clears throat> I think as such, the, um, the concept of transhumanism is quite interesting, like Marco was also saying, because it invites us to to think um, about different, about our extension of our capacities, which can of course uh, be used in a creative way, can stimulate um, the way maybe we run our planet differently, better, the way we live and, uh, and so on. But um, rapidly we talk about uh, the human condition, we talk about um, uh, gender, um, we talk about what is meaning, sense, um, uh, ethical things. Um, and what you can see is that this is, those people talking about transhumanism reflect on that, but it's not, it's just part of it, but there's no, ma no major reflection on this. And uh, so actually it makes it interesting for me as an artist to think in a different way on um, how transhumanism could actually be exploited or what, um, what could be used. And what I see, what me drives me is that mostly there are very evocative images, right? The idea you would um, freeze yourself, your body, um, after death, and they would wake you up, I don't know, 100 years later, flying in a spar uh, starship, or you would upload your brain in a clone, and of course we all know from Star Trek, the uh, turn of transportation. Um, the next point is that uh, the pros perspective are narrow and human-centric, so it's basically about us getting smarter, living longer, flying wider, um, and if I always say we would maybe connect more to um, the nature, it's certainly us which are in, in the focus. And I think what's also a bit missing is that um, maybe precisely because um, things are limited for us, uh, this creates actually our human condition which makes us alive as, as human. So we don't live forever and um, yeah, we have maybe our soul and we don't know what's going to happen, but it's not that um, Maybe because we don't know precisely about our soul, we cannot perceive everything this makes us human, whereas maybe transhuman would say you could perceive everything, you could know, you have all the data, you can become a superhuman, and uh, this is certainly a problem. So, <clears throat> I think that's why the point is, for me, that transhumanism is um, a starting point, as a concept, and uh, the title of my talk is uh, Existence Beyond Transhumanism. So I would precisely say to go beyond this transhumanist concept or enthusiasm in a creative and um, in critical way and use it more like a like a stimulus right and um, 
I guess what makes it interesting from the artist's perspective is to have a broader perspective and to, to put the finger also on the question which are not asked, right? Or which maybe are just neglected saying it's all going to be fine. I guess we all know the, the, the talk from the big American companies and, and people um, saying it's all going to be better. So on Mars it's going to be better than Earth and it's always in this linear extension that it will be fine. You just have to project and have to go there, which is um, certainly not, not happening. Um, <coughs> now, I guess what I then use from the artist's perspective is basically saying if I want to work on, the, um, on transhumanism, I would work on some sort of a research creation, which means I would dig into the subject, try to engage people to learn, and by evaluating um, the topics and the questions, come with the first idea of, of creation of um, things I would, I would establish. And the, the second part would then be to turn it into a critical making, which is this reflected hands-on crafting. And the crafting can also be to work on a, on a software package, but doing it actually is then the way to create and, and put it into, into, um, into life, right? And that's why um, I only do what I can do myself, so I would not ask people to make animation programming for me. Um, I can do it, I can learn it, and if not, I would not use it, right? And the third point is, um, is the possibility and the thinking that today um, we are all in self-referential systems, be it discipline, nations, cultures, um, um, continents, to engage any kind of meta system which would allow to, to connect um, those systems, right? So basically, um, a meta system is a, um, a complex of statements, elements, where all the systems would still try to connect without uh, getting into defense mode because sy systems typically if they fear they would um, they would deflect things or they would get reluctant or uh, just um, uh, not react to it but the meta system actually is the idea that it would allow uh, also from the artistic perspective that <coughs> those systems would open up and would go beyond the uh, defense mode voila so then in, uh, in my case what I like is that uh, if you think a bit about the transhumanism, the protagonists are often very um, pragmatic, I would say, in proposing solutions. They say directly, if you want to live longer, no problem, we freeze you in and then we um, wake you up 100 years later or we just upload your brain. They're not saying we don't know, it could be interesting, they propose solutions. And um, this connected to actually the um, the critical art making, where the idea is you would critically reflect on a uh, situation, on a solution, is actually what I like very much. This, this twist to say, okay, let's not take the transhumanism like it is proposed, but let's precisely shape it and let's engage people on thinking to work on that and, uh, and bring it forward. And um, in, in my case, I, I tend to use um, a lot of um, algorithmic generators of weak AI to, to work on that, in particular to generate um, variations. Because what you can see um, in all mainstream concepts, there is a, a narrowing down on, on solutions, on, on possibilities, there is a standard, and what is not belonging to it is often perceived as being negative or disturbing. And I think my interest as an artist is to, to open up um, perspectives, appearances, shapes, statements, and uh, using the generators in the wiki is actually a good idea. And um, I would sometimes go as much as that saying it's a little bit of a coexistence because if you play around with the, uh, the generators, you often don't know what's coming out. But basically playing and working with this artificial intelligence actually is a, is a way of, of, um, of going first of getting new insights and, and, and new, pers new perspective. And in the, um, this case, um, on the research I was working on the uh, on key topics, uh, you find here the ones I used, which I think there are, they would be interesting enough to trigger all this kind of generators. Because if you just use 
any kind of weak AI generators, you don't know what's coming out, so you need to have a starting point. For, for me, the part of the research creation was to get this, um, this um, starting point, so this, this key topics. And then I used different tools like um, from Art Breeder Generic Adversarial Network. You can work on the um, visual appearances, the OpenAI Generative Pretain Transformer. It's a lot about statement, so it's a, a language, um, a weak AI, and from recent studio, the algorithmic uh, quad node generator. So there, the idea was basically you see, um, I was elaborating on a starting point and then using all this kind of tools for generating very other kinds of variations in terms of sound, shape, um, statement. So <coughs> once this was actually done, um, I think you need to keep an eye on yeah, okay, so, no, fine, okay. So b basically, um, this was then ending up in, uh, in a um, feature clip where I tried to integrate all these elements for creating a narrative and, and the way that I wanted to shape the narrative that it's, people can actually connect to it, so I used a bit game-like, um, um, uh, aesthetics and um, as well um, traditions from Western and, and, and Eastern countries that so people would like to, to connect on this, right? So the um, so the, here it comes in the idea as, as the artist that you would once you have the technologies and proposed things, you would also act like a little like a interpreted or moderator. What you get from these variations, you would shape it in a way that people can actually again play around with it and get an additional twist on it. That was the idea. And um, for the final thing then, as an outcome of this work on the transhumanism, um, my idea is actually future of humanity is reconnected with planetary environments. I think if you're going to leave space, it's more than one planetary environment. And of course, we should much more be connected to non-human life forms that they are part of those environments, uh, rather than what you have today, this continued dissociation that human brain or the human sapiens trends to disconnect. And yes, the use of machine is interesting for new ideas, uh, get creating new perceptions, but um, we need safeguards that we don't want to get uh, overwhelmed by them or we get a, a narrowing down. And um, I think overall, of course, transhumanism is just another concept if you think about um, life, energy and flow. So all the circular fluid and endless. Um, so it's at the end the starting point rather than an end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Sorry to uh, rush you on, but we need to keep an eye on time. So, um, I'll give the mic to uh, Angelo, who has only one image, so that, but a lot to say. <laughs> Which is always interesting that we're talking about AI and transhumanism, but it still gives us lots of trouble. <laughs> so you will have to perform it, Angelo. <laughs> There it is. Hi, um, I have basically. What's that? Oh, close enough. All right. Okay. So my presentation will basically um, it's it's built around three short topics that I want to approach. It's going to be quite brief, I think. Um, the first one is is more of an historical perspective on transhumanism. The second one is more of a futurist perspective and more specifically talking about the post-planetary future of humanity. And then the last topic is queerness. Um, for the first one, we can actually say that historically there's been an ongoing decentralization of humanity. Um, there are a few names that are important in relation to this. Copernicus, Darwin, Freud. Each one of those uh, researchers basically decentralized humans in their own specific way, right? Copernicus, well, the Earth was not the center of the universe, too bad. 
Darwin, well, humans were just part of some evolutionary process that was basically happening for everything else. They were not really exceptional. And Freud really, well, brought to the intention that maybe we're not fully in control of what's happening psychologically. So surely, but sh slowly but surely, we, we, we got a different position here. Now, of course, this always generated a sort of backlash. It's not like culture likes to shift a position like this. Humans like to be in the center of attention. We like to be in charge. Um, so if you look historically, you can always see that kind of a double movement of decentralization and then people responding against that. And even today, you can actually see that happening. If we look around us, what's happening? Polarization, right, has increased dramatically. I mean, I just need, need to say one name, which I don't never like to say, Trump. Uh, is an example of that, of course, but we also have climate change, the corona pandemic, are all examples of this tension. Just to give you, an, uh, uh, just to clarify this a little bit, if we look at um, the corona pandemic, for example, there is the anti-vaxxers and the people that are against all the measurements and our people are proclaiming, I w my freedom comes first. That's really a position of the human-centered view, the individual that is really claiming their individuality. On the other hand, there are people that are really embracing the fact that this is happening, a pandemic is happening in a community, and that we're all connected, right? It's more of a relational ethics. So that's the other position. That's like decentralizing that individual. And so that tension is really, I think, is, is really key when we look at history and or the history of human civilization. Now the thing is for today, that basically you can really position transhumanism in relation to posthumanism. We haven't addressed it yet, but transhumanism is really, as my colleagues have really clearly indicated here, is this idea of augmentation, right? Humans becoming more powerful, augmenting their capacities with the idea of eradicating all the suffering that we've been going through since we uh, came to Earth, basically. Um, Post-humanism is a more critical movement that is basically focusing on how do we relate to other entities? How do we relate to biological organisms? How do we relate to artificial intelligence and technology? And it's really constantly decentralizing humans. You will find it in all the literature of post-humanism that decentralization is a key component and also blurring boundaries. And that's going to come back in, in some of the things I'm going to talk about later. It's really about these divisions that we created to make society working, like the, the strict division between what is male and what is female, to start blurring that, right? And that's really the interesting aspect, I think, of post-humanism. Now, for the futurist perspective, I'm actually um, very interested in the post-planetary future of humanity. Post-planetary future doesn't, is not some dystopian future where we gave up on Earth. Absolutely not. It's a very different thing. Post-planetary literally means it's a future in which humanity is spread out throughout the universe in different configurations. Some part of the population of, of humans will live on the surface of a planet. It could be the moon, Mars, Earth. But other people are living in different configurations. It could be a starship or some large space station at the edge of the solar system or beyond. And it's that, that entire collection of human configurations that is humanity. And that's a post-planetary condition where inevitably we are evolving towards. And you might disagree, and of course you can be very critical about it, and I am critical about this as well. But if you extrapolate where we come from, this is where we're heading for. Now, it's interesting when you think about transhumanism and post-humanism, there's actually a case for both when we think about that particular future of humanity. If we're going to live in space, we'll have to augment ourselves. Future astronauts will most probably be augmented humans. Not because it's, you know, it's some, some, something that, that, is, that is appealing from a science fiction perspective, but because of bare necessity. Might be a combination of medical uh, changes, um, genetic adaptations, for example, it's already proven that the resistance to radiation in space is actually something that is genetically uh, coded. Some people are better able to cope with space radiation than other people, and it's strictly because of their genes. So you could start selecting people, of course, that are genetically uh, better, cap better able to cope with space. But on the other hand, you can also imagine to add genetic modification or gene therapy to this. 
Post-humanism is really interesting in, in, in view of this future of us living in these different configurations in outer space, because in order to build a more ethical future, we'll have to build a different relationship to the other organisms that we take along in this new world that we're creating. Biological organisms, artificial intelligence, and it will require more of a decentralization of humans, not the traditional top-down perspective where humans are controlling nature and in the end are destroying nature. So I think we can learn from both uh, perspectives for building, creating that future. On the other hand, there's also some problems with both. The first one is that when you look at transhumanism, there's sometimes this obsession with um, leaving the body, right? Because the body is just, yeah, it's, it's, it's so vulnerable. That's what Mark all, all, all also uh, in, introduced, that the idea of moving out of the body and, and downloading yourself onto a hard drive and then traveling through space as a hard drive and then arriving at destination as a hard drive and then kind of re-embodying yourself into some 3D printed body or something. I mean, this is the kind of science fiction that we know of, right? Um, well, that to me is something that I'm personally not very interested in because for me, the actual journey in space is the destination. It's not like I'm only focused on getting there in one piece. It's actually the journey itself. So I would much more prefer to, to experience that journey physically as a human body and within a social context, because I think that's really what makes us human. So the bodily experience and the social interactions to me are really essential. And I, I, don't, I think that there is a, a big problem with leaving that behind. Uh, another issue that you can bring up, which is coming more from the post-human, post-humanist perspective, and which is something I don't really know how to deal with. I'm a biologist, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, in the arts world and in the cultural world in general, there's been a lot of interest over the past 10, 15 years in non-human agents. You find it everywhere. All kinds of festivals are dedicating exhibitions and uh, discussions around non-human agents. It's like a buzzword. Um, and it's all very well to approach non-human agents from a post-human from a post-humanist perspective, like, you know, humans putting them less in the center and a more equal kind of conversation with them. But how is that relation with these other organisms going to be built in a very physical and very concrete sense? I mean, I can show empathy for all kinds of animals, which, of course, which I think many of us do, but how to push that further? and how to show empathy for organisms that might look not as cute as many of the organisms that we seem to like. How to extend that empathy over all living organisms, and then more crucially, how on earth are you going to communicate with, with them? How to build that communication, and then bringing in another class of entities, artificial intelligences that might evolve on their own, and then creating that environment where everything can communicate, can, can empathize with each other, at this point, I really have no idea how that, if, that, if that is even ever possible. So I think even though it sounds ideologically very beautifully and ethically very interesting, um, I see some, some big hurdles there. And then the last point is this, this topic of queerness. There's, of course, a real clearly established link between post-humanism, decentralization, remember, and blurring boundaries, and queerness. I think Donna Haraway is probably one of the most famous uh, examples of that, the Cyborg Manifesto, but there's also Rosie Braidotti, Catherine Hales, they've all written interesting books about these topics, and it's always the same thing. Um, it's that this, the, the, the blurring of boundaries between categories which basically imprison us, that becomes a, a force of liberation, right? And it's really interesting to start thinking differently and removing those categories from the way we approach and analyze the world and start to inhabit those inter, inter zones ourselves, right? So that's really what, it, what, what is interesting there. Um, there are different examples, of course, and for example, one of, the, one of my favorite science fiction books is The Player of Games by Ian Banks. It's a very good science fiction novel. It's part of the culture series, and there the, the protagonists actually, throughout the novel, switch between uh, different genders. And depending on which gender they have, of course, it will have an impact on the story. So the identity of that particular character is, is all genders in one. So that's really an interesting example. Another example which I found more problematic is the latest Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049. I think 
It was by um, a beautiful movie by Denis, Denis uh, Villeneuve. Visually gorgeous, of course, but I was constantly drawn out of the movie because of the problem of heteronormativity. It's very strongly present in that movie. It's like we have this futurist um, world, but it's all about the male gaze on the female body. So there's just beautiful females, beautiful shapes, and men staring at them and being mesmerized by them, mesmerized by them. But there is nothing in the other way around. I don't see any beautiful male bodies, for example. And more, and what is even more problematic, there is no gender fluidity. I'm like, how can you create such an incredibly detailed future and have this very old-fashioned patriarchal view on the? I just, I just couldn't. It just didn't let me go and in, get into the movie. Now, and here I'm concluding. The examples that I've brought up so far are gender oriented. So I've talked in, when I talked about queerness so, f so far, I talked about gender. Now, we had an interesting discussion with our, and this is, this is kind of coincidence, with our collective, the Seeds Collective, this afternoon. And uh, one of my um, uh, colleagues there, Diego Maranan, brought up a very interesting um, statement. And he said that actually queerness can be expanded into transdisciplinarity. And there is an interesting relationship between transdisciplinarity and queerness, which I was like an insight that I, <laughs> that I literally had today. And let me briefly explain what this means. Transdisciplinarity is, of course, it's, it's not doing, it's not, a, how to put it, it's not building a practice from doing different things from different disciplines. It's really building a new practice that incorporates, absorbs different disciplines. That's really a, a big thing to realize here. And it, it's such a beautiful, a beautiful insight because it's true. When you're working transdisciplinary, you're suddenly decentralizing a particular discipline. And moreover, you're dissolving the borders between those disciplines. So it's suddenly, it's very, it, in a way, it's very liberating. And in a way, it's actually a radical transdisciplinary practice is basically combining the core idea of transhumanism and posthumanism. Because on one hand, it is helping you to augment yourself, right? If you're embracing multiple disciplines, you're acting as a form of augmentation. But at the same time, it's also an act of decentralization. So even though I started my conversation here with bringing up polarization, I'm basically ending here, embracing, fusing those forces in a transdisciplinary practice. Thank you, Angelo. I, I think you've brought up also uh, very interesting points and we're trying in the discussion that we're now going to have uh, to uh, include some of those points. Uh, but we've also discussed amongst each other that this is only a starting point because it's clear that we can't say everything in, in well, what's left half an hour, I guess, more or less. So we try to do something. So um, if we take as tonight's starting point a positive take on transhumanism, and uh, I, I think that, that bringing in queerness is actually quite important, but that that seems to talk to all three of you in in uh, in one way or another because it's clear that that's also why we we uh, call tonight notes uh, of transhumanism because it's clear that none of us is is completely in in favour of it as as it's usually um, uh, projected. Right. So if we take a positive talk take on transhumanism, then this can be seen as an interesting stimuli for reflecting on desirable futures in light of human activity on Earth, which is provoking serious issues for humanity itself, but as well for other species. What if transhumanism is not a mere extension of lifespan, but a reconsideration and re-evolution on what constitutes humanity and even a going beyond the humanity idea? This could be seen as an invitation to reflect in transversal manner between science, art and other disciplines on new and experienceable scenarios linked to non-human based creativity for the future of us. Now, I must say this question was written before Angelo had his talk <laughs> this afternoon with his, with his um, collective because I think that answers it already for, for quite a bit. Uh, can you discuss? I mean, if, if Mark wants to uh, uh, respond, then please say so, because you're part of the conversation, obviously, as well. But, so, any one of the three. 
And, and also I wanted to add that it's interesting with bringing up the queerness that you start, because the panelists are all male, but you bring up uh, actually uh, quite important women like Don Haraway, Bardotti and Catherine Hills, who have written really important visions on, on what to do with transhumanism from a post-humanist point of view, uh, which is really interesting as well, I think. And maybe it's, it's also the instigator for for looking at a broader way and mingling and, and using this kind of queerness. So who wants to respond? Yeah, um, I can respond uh, um, briefly. So, so yeah, um, I think it's great that uh, Angelo brought up post-humanism because I think it's an important distinction to be made here. So for me, transhumanism, it's not only the, the idea of augmentation, but there is an ideology about super intelligence. And there is also the, the link uh, potentially with, with, with neoliberalism and capitalism, uh, which kind of hijacks these ideas about augmentation. So um, I think I talked about transhumanism and the dangers. Posthumanism for me is much more philosophically interesting and and also politically interesting because um the 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 uh, blurring of the boundaries is is something that can be very liberating and very you know opening up uh also a more uh, path towards more uh, inclusive societies so i i think uh, both uh, on earth and, and and elsewhere perhaps um if we can solve the, the issue of communication so th this is really i think uh, has much more potential um, what I think transhumanism and, and posthumanism share is the, the belief that humans and technology can really do things together and that it's not necessarily um, a, a problem, right? Uh, and, and, and for creativity, for, for um, also in society. So, um, so that's something I think that we should uh, embrace. But, but I think yeah, the, the transhumanist uh, narratives and the science fiction connected with it, I find very problematic. Whereas uh, the, the, the post-humanist ones could could open up uh, new avenues and and I think are, are very inspiring. So yes, um, first of all, I think also Natasha Bita Moore, who wrote the uh, Transhumanist Manifesto, mm -hmm. is also exactly. film representative. Um, <clears throat> I think, of course, then we, we could conclude saying maybe the posthumanism is the more interesting thing, or it's the more promising than it's the um, the, the, um, the transhumanism, right? Um, my take on this would be the following. Um, the transhumanism is mainly driven by the by the big platforms, by the players, right? And it's all about standardizing and occupation and bringing it down to categories. And then of course we are precisely what we have today, what we don't want, what we want to overcome, right? And if you think of how AIs function, they have this idea that they categorize in uh, in sequences, and then we are back to old uh, old patterns. Um, so. At the other side, you could say, okay, let's take the posthumanism, this is the way forward. My other take is that uh, today, as humans, we are here today like we are. So the, f the fact that we have pollution and, and gender inequality and all that we have is because the way we are, right? And my attitude would be to say then, okay, if we can coexist with other life forms and machines, this could actually help us and the others to, to advance, because if not, I don't think that if you just say, we, let's do act in a post humanist manner, we go on to solve the issues. So for me, this idea is that actually we, we enrich our capabilities by this opening up in terms of categories and, 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 and if you want, collaborators. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting when you think about the evolution of how we think about something like transhumanism. And it, it, it's very parallel with how we think about the internet. Um, some of you who are old enough to have witnessed the birth of the internet will remember that in the, in the early days it was going to be the technology, the, in, the cultural instrument that was going to liberate all of us, the global village. Um, everybody was going to be equal. It was this utopian ideological conversations about the incredible, uh, beautiful, rosy future that was going to be delivered to whole of humanity because suddenly so many sources of conflict were going to be gone. They couldn't have been more wrong, right? 
it's completely it's it's basically completely opposite and so i think the the shifting perspective on transhumanism is very it runs very parallel with that i think transhumanism is in it's difficult to disconnect it i mean it's it's point it, it's basically embedded in cyberpunk culture right from the the 80s or starting from the early 80s and in that perspective um, that transhumanist embrace was an act of rebellion. It was really an act of gaining access to um, technologies and tools through a hacking ethos that would actually enable you to subvert the system. And you find it back, you find this, this is a trope, a typical trope for, of course, for cyberpunk. So there was this, this counter-cultural component of transhumanism. Nowadays, Transhumanism is much more connected with Silicon Valley, with elites that are able to augment themselves or to make trips to space for just a few minutes and then come back down to Earth because they have the means to. So there is a huge shift there. So suddenly transhumanism is more a device of power and of even of oppression instead of a, a, a tool for uh, liberation and for rebellion. So I think that's where, where the, the shift happened. Well, if you're talking about subversion, I, I want to shift the discussion slightly into um, a question around uh, soul, uh, the soul that we could maybe find in transhumanism. So, Peter, you have dedicated a full website called Robosoul and the Dream of Ethical Harmony, on which states, you state that humanoids or social robots have a soul, which is something that we might not think of. In recent news, footage on the recent developments of these robots, there's usually a reassuring remark that they can certainly not act independently. Um, the notion of a soul suggests otherwise. Uh, I don't know if people need to get explained what humanoids are. Depends a bit on... Do you know what humanoids are? No? So it might be useful to give a small explanation of that. Okay. Um, I guess... Uh, thank you. I guess most of you know um, the robot or the humanoid Sophia, right? So a humanoid is basically um, a robot who has a human-like appearance. And of course, we are in a society where all have to please. So often these humanoids look very pretty and, and very fancy and have all those elements of, of being connected and, and branché. Um, of course, the robot soul is a little bit of provocation. So what I liked four years ago when I started the work on that was that um, it's an interesting concept to play around and people can follow you, right? So. Um, I had the first project thinking rights for humanoids. So, um, and then if you think about it, immediately you're back what are rights for humans. So that was the, was the interesting point. Uh, and then I was thinking, okay, these um, humanoids, they might also have, they might be depressed. So then we can work on a short musical therapy. And then of course, uh, the humanoids are maybe more efficient. So you could have one minute version but maybe they take the human version, it's 20 minutes because they don't want to have this efficiency pressure. So all I think, you, you work around on this blurring boundaries between a human-like experience but being a machine, but maybe cool, and a human, yeah, having sometimes machine-like behavior. If you talk, if you think if you call a call center, those people are sometimes like robots, right? There's an interesting boundary we can actually um, work on, on categories and fixed convictions which normally people would not accept to talk about, right? Um, because if you think, you say, okay, I would uh, allow a marriage between a human and humanoid, immediately you rethink what means marriage uh, in the past or what could mean in today or is it cool or not cool. And that was the, uh, the starting point of this project. And I think this, um, this can go on, it can be exploited. Um, we discussed this afternoon. That's also an interesting part, of course, we always think that the other, even the artificial one, is like us. So it's our size, it's our way of communication, our lifespan, but they can all be completely different. It's also a thing to say, um, imagine a robot who is um, 100 times more intelligent than you. What does it mean? An EQ of 5,000, you have no idea about it. But then you immediately think about what means EQ and what means maybe culture and, and education. Um, yeah, I, I think that that is also where uh, the queerness comes in, actually, because uh, humanoids look like us, but we created them yeah. uh, to our image. Uh, but 
Mark, this notion of a soul maybe also allows to make a connection with uh, your work on uh, when machine to machines talk, in which you specifically discuss the notion of language and technology, and more precise language as technology and vice versa, and taking Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations as a point of uh, departure. Talking yeah. seemingly makes robots or humanoids more human, as demonstrated in, in a video by Peter. Uh, can you discuss this notion of language? And, and mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with uh, Peter's suggestion that it's really can be helpful to think about robots in order to think about humans, to, to think about what how it is that we um, approach things um, in my case, I studied how we respond to robots, how we um, think about the moral standing of robots, uh, whether there is something that we owe them, whether there is some. So this kind of topics make think about what, what is it that, you know, um, um, how, how do we give other entities, how we, how we relate to other entities. And um, language plays a role there. So I argued that um, we, we don't usually think about that, but the way we talk about other entities and the way we um, talk to other entities sometimes already kind of configures the status of that other enti entity. So that's for humans, for animals, for robots. Uh, for example, if I talk to a robot um, giving it a name, then I already treat that robot um, as if it were a person, and this can be very problematic. Um, but I'm interested as a philosopher to understand what's happening there. How come that we that we talk like that, and and the, the performative role of language there also that that by by using uh, a pronoun by giving a name. Um, we, we make it make the robot into a person. Um, similarly, we can talk about other human beings as if they are not persons, right? So we can talk to someone uh, or not talk to someone and, and treat someone else, another human being, as an object. Um, so I think language, the use of language is, um, is very powerful, very performative, and it's really directly related to to the way we think and and has uh, ethical and political consequences uh, so that's why i think it's important in uh, you know when we're thinking about other entities for example in this post-humanist framework to to think how you know how to approach other entities if we don't know them for example right so do we do we take a colonial attitude do we see them as as um as objects that need to be used do do we rather you know see them as others that need to be respected and so on um and so in that sense the um thinking about our our relation interaction with robots is is really a helpful way to to think more generally about how to uh, how we humans do and and should relate to other entities um, and that I can imagine that can also be very important if you have a project uh, more what, what Angela was talking about of going in space and, and meeting other entities. Yeah, exactly, because yeah, exactly. that's... Oops. I hope this still works. Yeah, because, no, it, it made me think effectively uh, on what you had said, uh, Angelo, about how to communicate with the non-human. Uh, and, and uh, notions of authorship, maybe, where you work in a collective. So is, is the collective, in that sense, if a way of communicating with other entities, including human, non-humans? Well, I mean, when I, when I talk about the collective, I usually talk about our, you know, my fellow human friends. Um, Yes, but of course, this is just, actually, you, you bring up a good point. Maybe I should start imagining something different in my head when I use the word collective, which is, which is interesting. Um, so we make work um, with our collective in which biological agents and uh, digital technologies all co-create. 
So we make artworks that are co-created by a whole group of people. So it's like really social experiments on a large scale. We built um, uh, one of our projects is called Biomod. We just built a quite big version in Bruges. Unfortunately, the exhibition is just closed. Um, but during the whole summer, you could see it. It was built with 160 people, partly from Bruges, partly remotely collaborating. So the authorship is really, well, it's, it's, it's not one singular artist there. Of course, we're not the only ones. The idea of an artist collective is something that's pretty old. But we're also introducing, uh, trying to explore how biological organisms can, can kind of create the work without necessarily exactly doing what we expect them to do. I mean, this is not always successful and it's a difficult dialogue. And then on top of that, we have the third kind of category, which is the, the technological agents. And I think we're not so much building an environment for um, actual discourse between us and algae and plants, but the act of co-creation is definitely one way in which you can bring together uh, different entities and make uh, move forward as a as a group. Yeah, I brought this uh, also up because if you talk about language, the, there's a recent book by Vincent de Pré about the language of uh, um, uh, la poulpe, the now I forget <laughs> the octopus. Yeah, and and other animals that in and in, in the way that you can see language. So even if it's not a conversation or as we know it <laughs> between algae uh, maybe the, she, she brings up the idea that language can be seen in a, a different kind of way in, in, and I have the feeling that in bringing up post-humanism as well and, and various aspects also by Mark and, and by, by Peter that we're getting somewhere in terms of um, authorship uh, collaboration uh, what do you think Mark? Yeah, um, I think the, the question of communication, I would say it's not just uh, language because then we all, always think about human language. But uh, Angelo used the word commun communication. I think that's that's a, a good term. And, and um, to think about this kind of issues in a, a communicative framework is uh, can be very uh, helpful. Um, also, the the the, uh, the word communication um, is related to to commons and community and so there i see again a political side also right so can we uh, can we move away from private property towards a more common good and and uh, and what kind of communities do we want to create uh, communities which with which are not defined solely in, in human terms um there is already for for a while in political philosophy also thinking about how to um, include animals in in political community um and i think it's it's uh, it's provoking but also uh, intellectually interesting to think about you know what about technology and and how to to integrate uh, technological entities somehow or recognize at least their the political um, significance they can have. Uh, for example, the, the robot Sophia was mentioned by, by Peter before. Um, in, uh, in an article with Jana Parviainen uh, argued, argued that um, uh, this robot was also used for, for political purposes. Uh, by talking about, about rights and so on, actually the idea was to um, yeah, to further the interest of particular states and a particular company, you know, and and so um, I think uh, robots are and and uh, and cyborgs and so on are, are also always political, and that's actually a thought that was already in Haraway, for example, in posthumanist writing and in in the, the cyborg manifesto, um, which was um, as much a manifesto about cyborg. And, and science as it was a manifesto about political issues, yeah, right? Feminism, especially in, in her case. So um, so I think it's, it, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, in um, thinking together technology and, and politics. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I think, how, we, how are we doing in time, uh, Alexandra? Okay. In that case, I want to 
end with a, another topic which is, seems to be important when you try to um, cross boundaries in a transdisciplinary way, nam namely the, the idea of play and playfulness. Uh, and, and Angela, you, you mentioned the biomod installation as well, in which you also uh, let the, the visitors interact with the multiplayer game. Um, can, can you discuss that a bit further and, and the notion of play as important? I, I see that also as a sort of crossing between, I mean, uh, I don't want to skip the politics altogether, but I think actually that, 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 that it's related in, in, in a way. Um, yes, just to explain for people who, who don't know the project. Um, so the Biomod project is like a huge sculpture with computer parts that were recycled. It's a network that is actually working. And then there is ecosystems that are built inside of the electronics that grow with um, the heat that is generated by the electronics. There are sensors that are picking up signals from plants and bacteria. They're being fed back into the network. So there's this back and forth between digital technology and all kinds of organisms living closely with the technology. Now the network is used for a multiplayer game, it's not a commercial game of course, it's more like an abstracted computer game that is being fed using the data from the organisms and where people can interact. So it's really an, a sort of nexus where humans, biological organisms and technology come together. Now the idea of play is of course because it, it, it does generate this openness. I mean it of course is always a balance between, because games have rules. That's what specifies a game, right? But it's because of the, the setting of the rules that patterns and interactions can emerge. And I think that's really the beautiful thing about it. And that's also a political aspect, I guess, of, of gaming. It's this openness that it generates. And even subverting a game is part of a game. And that's what a game actually provokes you to do. So, and I think that th this is really, I think, the, the key part of, of also why we are interested in, in, in play. Did you want to respond to that, or maybe Mark later on as well? Well, um, I think the um, for me the game comes in two ways. First, like Angela was saying, it's about the, the co-creation. So this playful um, co-creating. I think also in the game, if you transgress, we always open up perspective. Um, and that was important. Um, and I also think game is a way um, today a lot of society's perception is going to work. So I think if you see what is happening on all the applications that how, how many people spend how many hours on, on online games or whatever, I think part of our society is just gaming all the time and that's the way they function. And, and uh, I think a lot of what we discussed today is also going to um, be uh, communicated in this gaming world, right? I'll talk about politics, maybe via the avatars and the, the capabilities and, and, and the roles. So I think it's also interesting not only to see this gaming as the, um, um, like Andrew was describing, but to say it's actually how our society functions. So if you want to connect those people or even have maybe some sort of, I wouldn't say impact, but reach out and, and get a resonance, the gaming is a fundamental uh, experience or element. Mark, can you give a final remark on that or a reaction on that? A yeah, quick reaction on, on play and gaming. So I find uh, it's an interesting concept because in terms of social relations, um, it's uh, on on the one hand, um, it's true that that the game has rules, right? Um, uh, but on the other hand, there's also the element of, of freedom and spontaneity. And um, what I find interesting is that when when children play, um, the the play uh, establishes the rules uh, while playing, and the the rules are established together while playing, whereas often we adults play the games other people wrote the rules for, right? So this has to do, in that sense, there's a political aspect. And uh, I think it would be great if we could, um, you know, when we are doing all these technology games, as I call them, um, if we could uh, take up more this attitude of, of uh, playing together, uh, also as adults, and uh, and finding out what the rules are on the way uh, together, uh, because I think uh, that's that's uh, a more open way and, and a, uh, you know more productive and creative way of of moving forward with humanity, which is of course a, a topic here also. So uh, if we can uh, play more 
um, uh, rather than uh, yeah, playing the rules set by, by a very um, small amount of people. Thank you, Mark. I think that that's a really beautiful note to end with before I uh, try to get some, maybe there are some questions in the audience, but playing together is also what we discussed actually in a way this afternoon in, s in the sense of how we want to continue this, this conversation. I mean, tonight is, is, is this conversation, but we want to, uh, Peter and I were sort of thinking of, of continue to play together and, and <laughs> Mark just uh, happens to, to, to say it without having been there, but maybe somehow you were there, Mark. So, um, are there questions from the audience uh, or reactions? If not, then, because that's always the awkward <laughs> moment in, in, in any kind of talk, uh, I would say we stop here and uh, I thank you very much for, for all being here, Mark. Um, Angelo and, and Peter, who actually was the, the instigator of, of tonight, who came with the proposal. So thank you very much for that. Um, we will be organizing one other talk with, uh, and we're, we're still discussing it, but one of the guests is Joost Rekveld, who's here tonight. Uh, so uh, you will hopefully be able to meet him again uh, in uh, live, but then on this side of the room uh, in a couple of months. And so if you want to stay informed and uh, follow us on, on uh, the social media, I would say. Thank you very much. <laughs>